bringing you another fine podcast from Art Report Today. Hello, my name is Michael Delgado of A.G. Geiger Presents, and I'm on special assignment for Art Report Today. I'm thrilled to share my interview with the legendary feminist performance artist Barbara Smith. Smith recently celebrated her 90th birthday and remains a force in the Southern California art scene. A huge trove of her work, writings, videos, and correspondence were recently purchased by the Getty Museum's Research Institute Library, where they are being cataloged and ensuring that her work will go on to inspire new generations of scholars and artists alike. Smith heard the call to be an artist while studying art history and religion at Pomona College. But she took a 1950s society influence detour to get married and have children. Nonetheless, Smith, who has always been interested in new technologies, was making collages using a state of the art Xerox 914 copier, whose giant bulk she and her husband leased and installed in their living room. But in 1965, the call became louder and she boldly enrolled at the Chouinard Art Institute, then California's premier art school, and at the time, home to the class of a boys club that would pass through on the way to defining the California cool associated with the era. Ed Ruscha, Larry Bell, John Altoon, Robert Irwin, Chuck Arnoldi, among many other notable and now very bankable names, haunted the hallways. Smith then sought an MFA at the University of California, Irvine, where she became a recognized leader in her own class of artists that were shaping an entirely new movement. Along with Nancy Buchanan and Chris Burden, Smith founded F-Space, a sort of gallery which produced controversial exhibitions and performances, most memorably Burden's Shoot, in which, as listeners of this podcast are no doubt aware, involved, well, burden being shot in the arm with a gun. Smith's notable contribution involved naked people being duct taped to the gallery walls. It was quite a time, quite a scene, and Smith was the ringleader. Her story only really gets started there, and with so much work to consider over such a storied career, I wasn't sure where to start the interview. You've had such a long and illustrious career, you know, not only performing but writing and teaching and uh you know you've been a powerful influencer you know before that's how they would nobody would describe you that way but they would now um <laughs> and I, <laughs> so i was thinking you know like damn what a journey you know and, and uh so i didn't really know where to begin I, I i was hoping you know you might you know i was hoping you might tell me what you think were the most important pieces out of your prolific body of work and and um and then maybe we can you can help me put them in a more detailed context of the times and stuff um and and, you know what kind of reaction they got at the time and and what what and how you think they'll be seen uh years from now so i I guess barbara i'm asking you to do my work for me oh well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh gosh. Well, um um typically I've thought that there there are three pieces that are really singularly important because they represented the early trajectory of the work which had to do with sort of it was a feminist search for integrated identity, I guess you'd have to say, and you know, to find my personal voice. And the early work was more, the earliest work was more um, m- m- mysterious even to me. What am I trying to say? What am I doing here? But by the time um, I did the Feed Me piece, the Feed Me piece would be, well, let's see, no, I'd go before that. I'd, uh, the Holy Squash, the, ce- the mm. celebration of the mm-hmm. Holy Squash is also very important because um I saw it as um creating a new religion of uh, a female form a you know womb like form that held the birth of all these future squashes and that the um the squash itself was not exclusive it was com- 
available mostly all over the world there are squashes and and it's uh it's not a demanding religion it's more of a encompassing religion and a nurturing religion and so it was i saw it as a as a female spirituality and so that uh, first early uh, performance of the celebration of the holy squash in which i embedded the re- the remnant of a from a um, squash dinner into a, a cast it in resin and now it's this great big um, maybe 150 pound <laughs> resin casting but it is mm. Um, instead of the cross, it's the focus of my religion. And then in 73, I did the um, Feed Me piece, which was um, my taking charge of, a, of an art ter- a space, an art space in which I had the control of what happened in the room, even though I sat there naked and it was was playing on the fact that, in my experience, and most women's experience, we were sort of like treated as objects and marks, and 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 were um, being uh, assaulted and and seduced all over the world. But never thought of as a as a human being, as a person who had the right to say yes or no. Smith was a pioneer, using her own body as a vehicle for expression at a time when this strategy was only beginning to be explored by artists. Barbara would go on to describe birthdays, which is spelled D-A-Z-E, as a third most important piece in her body of work. Birthdays involved a performance meant to explore three phases of her female life experience in relation to men. In the first phase, she's harassed by men, and then in a reflection of the time, she's tossed between the young physical men who are being sent off to war and the older intellectual men who are making the decisions to go to war. It ends up with her and the younger artists in a tantric sexual ceremony, but I'll let her explain. I kept getting involved with two kinds of men. One was a sort of very physical guy and one was an intellectual guy, and I was going back and forth between them, and so that was going on as sort of my... I was falling into the structure of our culture, which had to do with mm. with um, the young men were sent off to war, actually, and the older men who were uh, the um, control of the politics and so forth. They sat at home and were safe, and the women were jostled between those two. Mm. And then finally, um, we went into inside in where I was um, in a, a tantric ceremony in which all aspects of humanity, my humanity, was present energetically, and I was in a tantric ceremony with uh, a, a man who also was in the same state for himself, and, and uh, we did, had a tantric sexual ritual there inside, and um, inside the gallery space. And that went on for over an hour, but people could come and walk through and leave by that time. Anyway, those are the three really... Yeah, those are strong. Barbara clearly knows best. Each of the three pieces touch on elements that have been constant in Smith's work since the beginning. Namely, Themes which involve sexuality as spirituality, such as in The Holy Squash, and the empowerment of a woman to make her own decisions, as in Feed Me and Birthdays. Smith was clearly in the forefront of a women's movement, as powerfully expressed through performance art, which radically embraced the ephemeral, and by extension, the rejection of object making and the related aspects of commerce. Although a well-recognized pillar of the feminist performance art movement at the time, Smith didn't really receive as much critical attention as some of her contemporaries, like Rachel Rosenthal or Carol Schneeman or, say, Linda Montano. In a 2005 review of her Pomona College retrospective, Sandra Esslinger wrote at the time for the critical journal Extra, quote, Something about the nature of her performances must have made it difficult for feminist critics to embrace them. Several of the performances suggest that Smith was more interested in being one of the guys in a male-dominated art world 
than in constructing a new performative female identity. Close quote. I guess that was a erudite way of saying her performances included Smith having sex. And so what's the difference from that and just being a manipulative courtesan? I asked Barbara what she made of that perception. Yeah, so many people read the Feed Me piece as if I was in there having sex with every man that came in. Right. And they misrepresented it totally. So she's reading it from that perspective as if I'm in there just fucking rather than um, making a stance that that all the things around the room that were available to interact with were a an effort to um, indicate that there was much more going on in a relationship between a male and a female than just sex. All these other ways of interacting, like food and and, and books and body oils and com- you know conversation and and uh, um, wine and so forth, those are ways that, that humans I- interact also with each other and we're always often being ignored in favor of just seducing the woman. Mm-hmm. And and so it was, a, it was a request for complexity that is really feed me, not just fuck me. And it was also um, um, that I, ha- and you had to ask me, in the room, what, what, would you like a glass of wine? Would you like a back rub? You know, they had to ask rather than just take. And, um, so, but the, the, the birthday piece was really, uh, totally a high point, which came from the fact that in my real life, I was, though I was going through the menopause, I was actually having the most, um, ecstatic sexual experiences I'd ever had with a man who was um, 15 years younger than me but he was but we were just having these amazing full body orgasmic experiences and when I and that to me was a signal that or a reality that I had was it was that it was that was completely integrated between the physical domain of sexuality and the spiritual domain. So what I was experiencing was a, a tantric or kundalini um, eroticism, um, but not, not because I was trying to, it just was happening. But then at the time, I began, uh, I was my one of my friends was a psychiatrist, and she was, she was wanting to... Um, teach men, her clients, who were otherwise sexually or normal, you know, that there's much more to sexuality than just lust. And, 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 and as a psychiatrist, she couldn't do that, but she, she engaged me and another, and another friend of mine to do these tantric ceremonies with her clients to trigger in them these higher levels of, uh, the orgasmic experience, and so uh, that take piece um, represented this um, integration, this um, what would the word be apotheosis of all of it. Yeah, so that that's why that piece is not a, a backward looking; it really was forward looking. Speaking of therapists, Barbara was involved with a therapist in the late 50s who recommended the writings of Betty Friedman and Simone de Beauvoir, and she was awakened to feminism and a woman's empowerment well before it would hit its stride a decade or so later. That's true. He, uh, one of the things he, he told me was that, that most of his clients, patients, whatever, were, were women like me who lived isolated out in the boon, in urban suburban um, L.A. area and, and, and only had children to talk to and a, and, a, a, um, uh, and a husband who came home at night exhausted from work. In other words, they were, there was no stimulus. Though they had gone to college or whatever, there was nothing going on that was uh, engaging them intellectually or um, passionately or anything. And so... You know, he recognized that this was a a big 
um, empty space in our culture, which it certainly was. And that's what Betty Friedan was addressing and also Simone de Beauvoir and, and ultimately others. I was in the impression Barbara was painting while also experimenting with the infamous Xerox machine. Uh, but I was mistaken. I, I also learned why she became enamored with the copier and where her interest in incorporating technology in her art may have come from. Not yet. I, I didn't... Um, I was just making paintings, yeah. And, and, and then um, by 1965, 66, I into a huge green and greenhouse in Pasadena, and we, oh, wow. and we rescued it. It was in danger of being torn down and... Because I had volunteered at the Pasadena Art Museum, I heard about, we heard about the fact that this fantastic house was in danger and we wanted to move in town and so we looked at it and we bought it. And it involved a lot of, um, it was mostly neglect. It was not mm-hmm. damaged, but just completely neglected. But anyway, we moved in there. And um, so at that time, I, I had this idea for um, a lithograph, I guess, and I and I uh, went to um, what I, I didn't know that that uh, Gemini mm-hmm. at, had had just started. I didn't know. I th- I just heard about Gemini, and it was a lot a lithography workshop, and so I just went there and I showed them this drawing and, and had could they. Could we print this? And they were sort of dumbfounded, and 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 said, "Well, you know, you you really have to have a gallery before we can um, <laughs> deal with you." And um, and besides, um, Joseph Albers is printing here now, and he was the very first person that they had print with them, mm. and 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 um, blah blah blah, and so. They basically were shining me on, and I realized that. And I'm driving home. I just got pissed off about because I had worked in the print uh, department at the Pasadena Museum, and I'd studied, you know, art, and and I knew that the prints were um, over all the centuries were were the um, were a democratizing way that art was. Um, passed on to the general culture and mostly the technology was used for information, you know, like to, uh, like lithographs was for newspapers and and um, printmaking in um, a block prints in uh, Europe was for spiritual information and stuff like that, but always there were one or two uh, Individuals who took the technology and turned it into a, an art form, and so Damier made lithography an art form, and 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 so I thought, well, what is the um, information processing technology of our time? How do how do we get our information out to the general public? And it's with um, business machines mm. at the time. Many of her Xerox series would be bound into books, and that body of work is now part of the aforementioned Getty Archive. The body of work included in the archive is so extensive, I was I really had to have a question for someone who never really made objects. How did you decide to hang on to the stuff? Did you think that that was how the performances would be remembered, or did you just were you just a hoarder? <laughs> no. Well, I, I thought of the um, the actions of uh, the, the performance actions as um, spiritual activities. That's one level of of uh, how they were working for me. They were means of my own personal transformation. The content, the way it was done, and so forth. And so. Um, so I began to th- think in terms of, you know, these things. First we thought, everyone thought, that these um, early performances should never be re- recorded because they only had validity if you were there, you know, if it, mm-hmm. the unrepeatable moment. Mm-hmm. And and then uh, both by learning what um, 
was happening in, say, in Europe, like um, Gina Pane and um, and uh, Schwarzkogler in Austria, but just and different uh, performance um, artists were were in various ways making a comment on their own performance on paper or and or. So what, what what we began I began to understand is that a one at a time a one moment activity action is yes it's powerful but it it, it actually has legs it, it lives on through the narrative about it and the experience of the people that were there and. And people at the time were were giving me photos that they'd taken of my early performances. Like there's a, a a fire rings piece that I did out on Newport Beach, and we had all these fires in fire rings around the beach, maybe twenty or so, and they were um, filled with fuel like wood and paper. But they also had a chemical put on so that they all started. Spontaneously, as if no one was there, and and no one was there when uh-huh. it started to burn, and 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 it was just fabulous. There's a whole more story to it, but the out, but the result was that somebody I don't even remember who it was took slides of of the, of that, and later gave me the slides, and I began to think, like we talk about the Declaration of Independence, or. <laughs> In other words, a culture work lives on its narratives as well as its moments of action, and mm-hmm. and uh, so soon we began to. And then I had this friend who is a whose his hobby was photography, and he kept saying, "You got to let me photograph." And so I did, and those photographs are fantastic, you know. And so we began mm-hmm. to let Boris photograph the pieces, and it went from there. And every other artist. Uh, that I know began to, in various ways, allow photography of these of the art of their performances, and that's how we know about them. With few exceptions, Barbara's work is ephemeral, and it cannot be transacted. When I mention that others in her circle, like Vito Acconci or Paul McCarthy, Chris Burden, and, and Nancy Buchanan, started making installations and sculptural, less time-based objects. I wondered if she were ever drawn to do the same. Barbara tells us how the demands of performing were in fact literally killing her and goes on to explain what ultimately saved her. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that is important. At a certain point, we all were completely exhausted by the demand that that performance made on our, our psyches because it was as if you know, okay, so I did this piece that, that, that was, say, say the feed me piece. Okay, now what are you going to do? Well, you had to go look deeper into yourself, and, and pretty soon it was asking the self to have, uh, what's the word, developed or evolved from the prior piece too soon. We never, it was like asking, you know, a painter will, will spend a year or so making a whole series of paintings of which they can choose four that they think are worth exhibiting and they can throw the rest away. Mm-hmm. Performance, you can't do that. And and so, and so you can um, rest in between the paintings and all of that. And so mm-hmm. it, was, it was just not comparable. We had no buffer. It was, it was just wrenching the inner psyche of all of the performance people and we, and we got exhausted in various ways. I had conversations with Paul McCarthy about this and and I was thinking that I was going to go well he thought he was going to go crazy he was starting to have um sort of hallucinogenic experiences and I was thinking I was going to have a, a breakdown mm-hmm. um because I everything impinged like I was not only not getting recognized for the work but I was also I had no money and I and I had lost my children in divorce things, and and I was completely torn down. And mm-hmm. so 
in that crisis, like Paul and Nancy, Nancy went into um, following video as a means to um, to make art, and various ones did different tactics to save themselves, to help them. And in my case, I thought, well, you know, like say Chris started making the B car and and other uh, sculptural like objects, and Nancy did the video, and and so I thought, well, but I I wonder if there's a way to keep doing performative things, but to have rescued my psyche. And at the time, I was here in Pasadena, and I was. Um, hanging out with um, Ed Wirtz, who was married to Melinda Wirtz, who was uh art historian friend of mine. And, and Ed was a Buddhist, had become a Buddhist, and had started the International Buddhist Meditation Center in downtown Hollywood, L.A. And he he said, he said, Barbara, you've got to learn to meditate. Well, that just was like saying you have to learn how to jump off, you know, do parachute diving. I mean, it was just, I didn't know how to, I tried, but it was just nuts. I couldn't do it. And so he said, well, the only way you can really learn is if you sit in these long sashins. They they would be like three days long, and you'd be sitting eight hours a day or five Uh. days long. And so I, I I started to do that, and actually it worked. I mean, because you have these extremely powerful transformational experiences, which allows the my being to get in touch with an inner um, emptiness and also quiet. You know that that, that mm-hmm. that's permanent. And so I found a way to go to a place inside me that was permanent. And the thing that I feared, though, was that the the work would just become tame. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. okay, let's all sit in a circle and meditate or something. Yeah, yeah. And But I had to do it because I had to, one way or another, kind of save my life. And that's what I did. And, and, and so from that time on, my work didn't change all that much. It did a bit, but I but I had a resource inside myself that could, and I kept on doing performative things. Smith would continue to mix her art and her life. In a notable piece called Twenty First Century Odyssey from nineteen ninety three, Barbara contrasted her life of travel with the self imposed internment of her then boyfriend, Doctor Roy Walford, into Biosphere Two. Now, Biosphere 2 was the notorious experiment in the Arizona desert to prove life could be sustained in what amounted to a human terrarium. A, a, a quick note, there, there's a fascinating documentary about Biosphere 2 that came out last year, perfect for the quarantine days of 2020. The film's called Spaceship Earth. You can find it on varied streaming platforms, and I, and I highly recommend it. So anyway, while Walford was sealed into the biosphere for two years, Smith would travel around the world doing performances and communicating with Walford through what was then cutting-edge technology, like faxes, and the very first video chat and email platforms. It was a monumental piece that can be compared to similar work by Vito Kanchi or Marina Abramovich, which are all about time. Looking at Odyssey today, I found it also to be a prescient use of technology to communicate personal narratives, a sort of expansive proto-selfie in which Smith casts herself as Odysseus to Walford's Penelope. Oh, that didn't seem like such an innovative thing, but I guess it was because it just seems like, well, you know, think of the abstract expressionists. They're making these uh, various paintings that are you know, vivid and dynamite, but they're coming from their inner psychological experience. And so I just thought, I'm, I, I guess I'm a, um, a, a um, next, next iteration of that. It's just like art for a certain sort of person comes from their inner experience. 
um, not it's not about something. It is something. 21st Century Odyssey is a fantastic bit of art. It resonates on several levels, but it could only have been produced in that particular moment, facilitated by emerging technologies that have now become so ingrained in every bit of our lives. Throughout Smith's career, the U.S. political and social scene roiled with violent protest and calls for significant changes. Civil rights clashes, Vietnam War protests, and the struggle for women's rights were all boiling over. I wondered whether Smith saw her work as furthering a feminist agenda and overtly political in that sense. I'm totally in favor of the feminist movement, and and uh, but I never saw myself as a political activist because it, at the time we didn't think of political action as art. You know, it was. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it was that was a borderline that women were exploring, and and I wasn't sure. I felt more that um, art was a separate domain. I don't anymore, but I did then, and and so. Um, at the same time, um, by by being an individual artist who was trying who was trying to become uh, taken seriously as a uh, as an artist in the art world, which is mostly men, entirely men, I I was saw myself as a feminist doing that in that way, you know, as a um, just like a painter. Joan Brown or somebody they they were mm. they are not necessarily making political paintings, but their pa fact of their making paintings and being taken seriously is their feminist statement. All of us were more carving um, space to just talk about our lives and art and and I guess. I guess I saw this as uh, seeking a plateau. Once women had claimed the space, then another generation go on and make, make any kind of art but political art without having to fight for it. Smith was indeed a trailblazer and is recognized as a powerful influence on artists too numerous to name. I asked her what she might be working on now. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sort of, you know, I'm I'm finding myself um, in my very comfortable place. I'm living in Pasadena, and and wi winding down all these different um, groupings of work and taking interviews like this with you, and and uh, I'm not pursuing much new work. In fact, none. I'm I'm finishing a piece that I. Started in 1972, it's a very funny piece, and it's called the Conspiracy, and it's about a, cons a, a, in a, a made-up conspiracy, and it's going to be, I think, in a show that's going to be at the Armory with Nancy Buchanan and Marsha Hafif in 2022. But that's something I started in 1972. So um, I, I'm, I'm actually. Um, Asking the question, what am I supposed to be doing now? Um, it's a funny, it's a funny time to be uh, who I am right now. You've been listening to a special assignment for Art Report today from me, Michael Delgado. My guest today was the legendary Barbara Smith. You can learn more about Barbara and her influential body of work through the wonderful archives of the Getty Research Institute. And you can look forward to seeing more work of hers in an exhibition at the Armory in Pasadena next year. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Art Report Today. Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com.